Thank you, Andrew, for that very kind introduction. And firstly, congratulations to all of you and what an incredible achievement it is for you to be students at one of the most prestigious law schools, not just in the country, but also in the world. In choosing to study law, you've chosen a course that will expand as well as hone the skills that will allow you to achieve anything that you set your mind to. Now, to, choosing to, to choose to study that at UNSW, you've chosen to study at an institution which will give you endless opportunities to achieve your goals, expand your horizons as you grow into the people who you are and who you want to be. Now, just to give you a bit of a background about me, I started my International Studies Law degree in 2009. I met some great people, studied fascinating subjects, wrote a ridiculous amount of notes, uh, and also got to study overseas at the University of Edinburgh, Copenhagen, and Columbia University at, in New York. Now, I didn't know what I wanted to do after I left uni, but while studying here, I came to realise just how much I could do. Now, the law faculty made me realise that studying law doesn't just limit you to commercial law, but that there are hundreds of other avenues that you can pursue. So really, your career starts now. It, made me sh it showed me th that things that I thought were beyond my capabilities were actually really within reach. So I do disclose now that I did go down the traditional career track of taking a summer clerkship at one of the big Sydney law firms and then starting as a grad. Uh, but since starting as a grad at Cause Chambers Westgarth, I went to work in Namibia. So just so you can visualise it, this is Namibia. As you can see, it's pretty arid, but it's still teeming with wildlife. So you've got the lions, pangolins, elephants, baboons, just to name a few. So I moved to work in Namibia to work in wildlife law. Now, what does this term mean? When I say it to people, usually I get a really puzzled expression or someone cracks a law of the jungle joke. But what does it actually refer to? So basically, I look at the way in which the law regulates human interactions with wildlife based on um, conservation, human wildlife conflict, poaching, illegal bushmeat trade. And so what can this look like in practice? So farming is one of the largest industries in Namibia. Uh, so a lot of the land that was previously used as rangeland for animals has now been converted into uh, to grow crops or to graze cattle. Now this brings humans and animals into greater contact. And the outcome of this depends on the animals that you're dealing with. So elephants can destroy crops, cheetahs can eat your cattle, crocodiles can eat you, and so on. <laughs> so you're a farmer and you find a carcass of one of your cows. So you can tell by looking at the puncture marks and the scratch marks that it was this guy, a leopard, who ate one of your cows. So you put a trap out to try and catch this, uh, you put a trap out to try and catch this leopard, and a few days later you come back and it's caught. It might not necessarily be the same leopard, but it's around your cow so you don't like it, so you shoot it, get on with your day. A few weeks later, you go and check on your cows again, and another one has been eaten. So you rinse and repeat, and this cycle continues on for years because leopards will sort of go into rangelands that's been vacated by a leopard that's been killed. So this cycle continues, and it's not helping the leopard population, it's not helping the farmer, but the law says that this is probably the best way to deal with things. So like so many legal issues, you have to consider the social, the economic, the environmental considerations that influence what policies and laws are in place and whether the current system really represents the best solution to these issues. So part of my role was to identify better ways to deal with things. So here we collared and released a cheetah that a farmer had caught in similar circumstances. Um, so we could track her and let the farmer know if she was in the area. So it saves the farmer from suffering livestock losses because he can plan accordingly. Now, I'll expand on those experiences a bit later. But I've been asked to speak to you today to give you a few tips and hints that I've picked up along the way since leaving high school, starting uni, and, and starting my career. Now, I can say that each of you have the skills and intelligence to get you through uni unscathed, but not unchanged, and that's a good thing. The next five or six years will be a period of challenge, excitement, and opportunity, which will prepare you for whatever it is, whatever it is you wish to do in the future. Having left, only, having left uni only a few years ago, I by no means profess to have all the answers, 
There are a few little tricks that I've picked up along the way that I'll do my best to weave into the next 20 minutes or so. So the thing that I want to talk to you today about today is fear. Now, this is probably not the first thing that jumps into your head of a topic to speak to bright-eyed undergrads about, but I think it's important for us to think about where it comes from and how it affects how we behave. So fear is an incredibly powerful emotion. It can have an almost all-consuming effect on us, and it's the reason why we were able to evolve and survive today, but by stopping us from going and frolicking in the fields and getting eaten by bears as cavemen. Um, but it can also push us to achieve new heights, like writing that bit faster at the end of the HSC, or to stop scrolling through BuzzFeed, because that essay is due in a couple of hours. That's the good type of fear, and it keeps us safe, and sometimes we need it to get things done. But there's another type of fear that isn't as openly spoken about as often as it may frequent your internal monologue, and that's the fear of failing, or not being good at something as the next person, and being judged as fairly by comparison. Again, this can push us to work harder and improve ourselves, but it can also prevent us from trying out new things, from fear of failing or being ridiculed by those around us. We live in a very meritocratic society that thrives on the notion that we can get whatever we want if you work hard for it. It's great in one sense because it rewards you for working hard. You own your successes and you can all appreciate that as people who did really well in the HSC and the Law Admissions Test, and as a result, you're sitting here today. Your successes start to define you, as your friends and family start to refer to you as a law student. Now, the implicit flip side of this is that it can also make failure incredibly personal, and in a society that privileges success, that fear of failing can be quite intimidating and inhibiting. So what do I mean by this? So when I started uni, I had really great intentions of joining all sorts of clubs and societies and <coughs> extracurriculars. But the first one that came past me was mooting which is basically a simulated court setting. Now, I thought to myself, great, an opportunity to practice some advocacy skills and meet other law students. But then I remembered my fear of public speaking. I hadn't done it very much, and I was sure that I would freeze once I got up there and would inevitably say something ridiculous that would make the whole room erupt in laughter. So I didn't do it. Next thing that came along, debating. Again, same thing, same fear, so not touching it. I did end up finding a few things that I wasn't terrible at and had a great time and met wonderful people. But I allowed that fear of failing at something to get the better of me, and I missed out. <coughs> so the most involvement I had with mooting was liking my friend's Instagram posts as they were off winning mooting competitions in The Hague. <laughs> now, this fear also limited how actively I chirped up in class, because I thought, I am surrounded by geniuses, and they are going to judge me so much if I say something wrong. But my first hint to you is this. You're here to learn by testing your boundaries, because this will ultimately determine how much you get out of this experience. No one will force you to join the mooting competition or to turn up to lectures on time or to get your work in, but you are in an environment to where if you do challenge your boundaries, you can fall over and try again, and I assure you that this is the more out likely outcome that you actually learn something, that you succeed. Either way, you have some of the best legal minds to, as your lecturers and some of the most interesting and intelligent people sitting around you as your classmates to support you. So I encourage you to be open to any opportunities that may come your way. Now, all this came to a head for me when I was trying to decide whether to go to Namibia to pursue my interest in wildlife law. Once I'd always been interested in wildlife, it's not something you'd typically associate with a law degree. So the first time I went to Namibia, before starting as a cause graduate, I managed to find a community legal centre called the Legal Assistance Centre, and they were working on wildlife crime regarding rhino poaching. Now, rhino poaching isn't a new issue in Southern Africa, but frankly, the rate at which it's occurring now is something that governments just aren't able to deal with. So to give you an idea, the rate at which rhinos are being killed is outpacing their birth rate, so they're literally being killed faster than they're being replaced. And a kilo of rhino horn can cost about 60,000 US dollars. That's more than cocaine and gold. So it's an extremely profitable enterprise. I loved researching the law around poaching and working on cases prosecuting wildlife poachers. But I did have to return home after a few months 
to, back to Sydney to start as a grad at Cause Chambers Westgarth. So I started as a grad. It was a wonderful experience and really great training. But when I was asked to go back to Namibia again and to work in wildlife law, I had a pretty tough choice to make. Now, do I leave the traditional career track of a well-paying job, job security, to work with some of the best in the business who will train me up, or do I take the path less travel, I suppose, um, with a role that's sort of laden with uncertainty, but I do get to sink my teeth back into something that I love. I deliberated for a few weeks, and cause were generous enough to give me a leave of absence from the firm for a year, so that took care of a lot of my concerns. <coughs> But there was still something that was holding me back. And that was the fear that I'd be classed by my fellow colleagues as friends as a loser if I came back at the end of the year with, if my wildlife law work didn't come off as I planned. So I obviously decided to go in the end. But this fear stuck with me until about a week before I was due to fly out, until I had a bit of a light bulb moment. So I was sitting at my desk at Cause, diligently working away, and I overheard two lawyers saying that it was so ridiculous that I was going off to do this fictitious thing called wildlife law and saying that I was only off to go and play with some animals. <laughs> Which, to some extent, was true. <laughs> but I wouldn't ordinarily categorise putting a GPS collar on an elephant as playing. I assure you that the elephant there is sleeping and it's not dead. <laughs> Now, they were definitely the exception to the otherwise supportive response I had from the rest of my other colleagues. But I still sat there and I thought, oh God, my worst fears are being recognised and confirmed. This is exactly what I was talking about. People are laughing at me, they're not taking me seriously. They thought that I was a joke and that my work would be a joke. So I sat there thinking and I thought back to a moment that I had during my first stint in Namibia, where I went on a trip with a little guy called Ollie. Now, Ollie had wandered across the border from Botswana into Namibia. Unbeknownst to Ollie, he was walking out of a Botswana legal regime that gave him complete protection from being shot into a Namibian legal system which gave various people permission to shoot him under certain circumstances. Now, elephants can be destructive to crops, so the government were quite keen to shoot Ollie um, and even though he hadn't actually caused any damage, so they issued a permit for the rangers to go out and shoot him. To prevent Ollie from being unnecessarily shot, we mobilised a team of farmers on the ground with their full drives and managed to find a guy with a helicopter so we could all herd Ollie back to Botswana, back to safety. So we guided him for a few days, and Ollie, with impressive dexterity, managed to clear fences without damage. And just so you can see, now, careful placement of feet isn't what I'd normally associate with such a tank of an animal, but he was pretty careful climbing over fences and not doing any damage. So, and off he went. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll go back to Ollie there. Um, so he was a calm and very happy elephant. And he didn't seem to mind that he had a convoy of four-wheel four drives and a helicopter buzzing around joining him on his journey. The farmers loved seeing this wild animal explore and were extremely proud to have him on their land as the adventurous Botswana elephant became a bit of a local celebrity in the newspapers. It was a wonderful experience to follow such an impressive animal on his adventure, especially one who exhibited such an interest and excitement and curiosity in the world. All the while, government officials were following us, waiting at the fence boundaries, hoping, with guns at the ready, hoping that Ollie would take a wrong step onto public land where they could shoot him. They even followed us so keenly that one day we broke off from the convoy to go fuel up about 50 k's away and they followed us all the way there thinking that we were going to lead them to where Ollie was. One of them even followed me into the bathroom to question me about him, but, you know, bought Ollie a few extra hours, so that's fine. Um, we tracked Ollie for as long as we could and we gradually moved him east towards safety. Unfortunately, his relentless spirit of adventure led him to keep walking one night onto public land, where he was shot by officials, just kilometres from the border with Botswana. Now, if you've ever seen an elephant, whether it was in the zoo, or in the wild, or on TV, you know that an elephant's life isn't a joke. And in terms of whether wildlife law is a joke, 
For that elephant, a country's laws could not have mattered more. His life, like many people's lives around the world today, was profoundly affected and ultimately determined by what laws were in place. So my colleagues are still having a laugh about me going off to Namibia. And I just thought to myself, I won't let fear of that kind of judgment ever prevent me from pursuing what I'm really passionate about. Recent events around the world have clearly highlighted the defining impacts laws can have on someone's existence. So if you see something that needs to be done about an issue that you care about, rise to that need. Remember, you can fail at something that you don't like, so you may as well fail at something that you love. Now, I did go off to Namibia, obviously, and it ended up to, to be an incredible experience. I was able to research the issue, talk to farmers locally, and also lecture students at Duke University. Having that independence, though daunting, was also freeing and allowing me to be creative and not just stick to the advocacy and policy side of things, just on a books level. So I worked on a TV show covering environmental issues that Namibia faced. In the course of filming, we got to work with the Namibian government on their anti-poaching efforts. Now, as I mentioned, the odds are really stacked against the government trying to stop poachers. There's too much space to cover, there's, there's not enough equipment, there's unmatched firepower, not enough resources, corruption, and all sorts of other factors that make this traditional method of fencing pangolins or rhinos or elephants in and fencing poachers out is just pretty obsolete and ineffective. So the government got creative and decided to take a new approach to relocate rhinos to private farms where they had more manpower and resources to keep a watchful eye over them. So that sounds great in theory, but it's actually not a simple process to relocate a rhino. <laughs> you need a helicopter driven by someone who's crazy enough to hover just metres above the ground to let the vet tranquilise and, and sedate the rhino. And then you need a ground team to make sure the rhino falls in the correct way and then to keep him cool and to remove the horn, which will grow back. And then you need a truck with a crane on the back of it that can ab that's able to lift a one and a half ton animal in a transport crate ready for its road trip. Now you also need a team of people who can drag a sedated, sleepy animal that weighs about the size of the weight of a car into this transport box. And you need to drive it off road into the African bush and also do it quietly to make sure that the poachers don't know where you are. So, the tip from this story is that you have to get creative sometimes. If something isn't working, change it up and try a different approach. There's no right or wrong way to use your qualification that you get from UNSW. I wasn't sure how I wanted to use my law degree, but there was no way that I could have predicted that a typical day at work could be doing legal research in the morning, filming wildlife in the afternoon, and looking after baby caracals or meerkats at night. If you told me that six years ago, or even one year ago, I would have called you crazy. You might have a really clear idea of where you're going and what you want to do, but in the event that things don't go to plan, your ability to adapt to the circumstances when they don't stick to the script will allow you to be resilient, and I promise you they will expose you to, to, you to new opportunities. Now, my final tip to you is to be independent in the way you define your success. Despite having great experiences in Namibia, things didn't go to plan. I left the organisation I was at because my bosses ended up negligently killing a lot of animals, and I could not, in good conscience, stay at a place that was so unethically reckless with wildlife. It was a difficult decision to make, but I've come out the other side of that experience more passionate and more determined to work in wildlife law. There are so many factors that influence our perception of what success looks like from advertising, friends, family, Facebook. And it's very confusing to tease out what kind of achievement will make you happy. Lots of people said that I should be happy because I have a job at a big law firm. Because for some people, that's what a successful career looks like, and there's nothing wrong with that. Material things can serve as indicators of, of success, even though we may not necessarily be doing our best or giving our all. What you need to do is to be the author of your own ambitions. Remember that success, what success is varies from person to person because we aren't all passionate about the same thing. 
Now, you've just come out of a system where success has been defined for you with marks and grades. And to some extent, that's continuing. But you're also now in the driver's seat to analyse critically what success looks like and what that will mean to you. So just to wrap up, I studied law because I wanted to understand society better. To understand the game, you have to know the rules. But if you don't like the way the game is being played, change them. The edge that UNSW Law School has is that it will prepare you to do whatever you want and be whoever you want to be. Don't let fear of judgment by others or the possibility of failure stop you from pursuing what you want or what you're passionate about. Because here, you'll be equipped with the tools to get you where you want to go. Don't let fear, sometimes misdiagnosed as practicality, dull your passion to be more than adequate or prevent you from committing to what you're passionate about. If things don't go to plan, that's OK. Be creative and figure out a new plan. You don't have to be perfect. You just need to be tenacious. But I promise you that more often than not, you will succeed. And I can say that with truth because you're already here. Congratulations once again. Best of luck and have fun. <laughs>